is it kind of surreal to just have your whole neighborhood invaded by these this entourage of media and celebrities? Absolutely. This is one of the quietest neighborhoods in town, I think, and we don't <laughs> yeah. get a whole lot of action up here. It's, you know, kind of odd because they're <laughs> right here and it's really unexpected. Parking's a little nuts <laughs> in town. Absolutely. A little but bit, but it's always nuts. Gotcha. We're going to talk to a couple shop owners here in Park City about the Sundance invasion. Does the town just get taken over by festival attendees during this insane event? <laughs> yeah, it does. It's a crazy 10 days in Park City. Not the busiest, but it's the craziest. You sell a lot of jewelry? One year we had a $160,000 necklace purchased. But sometimes it's just little pieces, and I think the craziness of the outside on Main Street... <laughs> $160,000? I just need some jewelry. $160,000. If you have 30,000 people in town that don't ski, and they're eating, drinking and going to movies. It's a restaurant bar owner's dream come true. Now, I'm just your average chocolate lover, but I'm sure you have a lot of celebrity chocolate lovers. Kara Sedgwick was in last last year, not this year, was in last year, and she loved our malted milk balls and our chocolate dip s'mores. Yesterday, we had Alec Baldwin and a new young girlfriend in. Um, we do have a watch on hold for him. We hope that he's actually going to be coming in. We've had Kate Catshaw has come in. And Mrs. Spielberg. And Mrs. Spielberg, Mrs. Yes. Steven Spielberg. During the festival, you host countless parties for movies, celebrities. Go ahead and brag a little bit. Tell us about some of the parties and celebrities that you've seen. Well, last year was Robert Redford and Ben Kingsley. Rita Wilson, Muriel Hemingway, Jeff Goldblum. Eddie Van Halen. Meg Ryan's been in before. Uh, out of the Hollywood scene, Tiger Woods has been in the store. Last year we had Russell Crowe, which was unbelievable. This is one of our most valuable pieces in the store. It's 142000 It's a decolored diamond. Probably the uh, best known, best repeat customer I have comes in for my cashew peanut brittle and a teach Marin. This is like seven cars. That's how men think about it, yes. <laughs> Al Sparrow up the road. Oh, really? He, of course, no. you've probably heard that a million times. I'm on the list. I'm on the list. you got to hook me up with a batch of well, I think we can work a deal out. Mmm. Mmm. Great cure for the munchies. Great. Born like this, into this. As the chalk faces smile, as Mrs. Death laughs, as political landscapes dissolve, as the oily fish spit out their oily prey. What made Charles Bukowski so unique as an author? Bukowski transformed poetry from something that we're forced to read in our classrooms. You know, it's very elevated and it's very academic and it's abstract and it's hard to understand. And Bukowski brings it down to his, his voice is the simple voice of truth. And it makes poetry something that is relevant and meaningful and um, inspiring and, and in many cases uh, life changing. What did you learn about Bukowski that surprised you? He has this reputation as being the mythic drinker and the, you know, the drunk and the brawler and the, the kind of the, the reprobate. But hearing stories of how he loved his daughter and how once he, he put her into his crib and he actually she dropped a few inches because he thought the crib was closer than it was and he, he was crying about that. That's not what you think of Bukowski. I hope <clears throat> that uh, maybe some, <clears throat> some young kid me, sees it and uh, <clears throat> is encouraged to maybe follow their heart as he did. Um, in this, in this culture, you know, we're, we're just, all the forces are down on us to, to go out in the world and get a career and make a lot of money and, and do these things that are important maybe to our parents and our teachers, and, but it's not always what's important to us. And maybe uh, it'll, it'll create a miracle in, in some people's lives, and that's what I hope for. And there will be the most beautiful silence never heard, born out of that. The sun hidden there, awaiting the next chapter. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hats. Woo! Many, many hats. You know, in New Orleans, they ask you to, you know, take your shirt off. Would you take off your hat? Woo! Everybody in Park City has hat here. Go for it. Do it. There you go. Where's my beads, baby? Where's my beads? You're not going to get some beads out of me, but let's see it. Nice! I'd like to ask you to take off your hat. Don't be afraid of your bedhead. Take off your hat. You guys got bedhead. Bad bedhead. Let's see your bedhead. Whoa! Do it. Take off your hat. 
Do you know what I do at the Shangri-La? You're cooler. You turn winners into losers. Do you know how I do that? Listen, I know there's a lot of stuff that happens in casinos all the time. I do it by being myself. People get next to me, their luck turns. It's always been that way. What inspired the story for The Cooler? Uh, my co-writer on the project, Frank Hanna, he goes to Vegas all the time and loses a lot of money. And he always, he doesn't want to blame it on himself. He always feels there has to be a negative element that enters the room. And when he starts to think about it, if I was standing at a craps table, I'd probably kill it for everybody because I've had the worst luck my whole life. So how did you go about casting the film? Um, I mean, the cast is phenomenal. We wrote this with Bill Macy in mind. The moment the idea came together and I said, we're going to work on this together, it's, this guy's Bill Macy. There's nobody else that I felt who could have played this role. The humanity that Bill brings to a role, and, you know, I, I know the women find him sexy, and we needed a combination of a guy who was a bit schlumpy, but then could, uh, you know, evolve into be almost like a romantic lead. William, you, um, you wanted to get out of the habit of playing the, the quote, loser role, mm -hmm. yet um, this one, there was something about this script that attracted you. What made you want to do it? It's a love story, and I'm just a sucker for love stories. I really yeah. like them. I believe in this. I believe in the transforming power of love. And play this romantic, beautiful person that you know mm. that that you are, which you you don't get to see this kind of romantic side of you on film, which I fell in love with. But for the research for the film, oh, um, grow up. Did, we didn't did do, do any research. You didn't do you any research. Nobody no. researches <laughs> like this. No. Is that a myth, then, when it's actors say, "I've got to do a lot of research"? It's just. Yeah. You're a good actor. No. You don't need to. Except no. for Boogie Nights. I did a lot of research for Boogie Nights. <laughs> How'd that go? Good. <laughs> Do you have a game that you're really good at? For me, my yeah. game is Blackjack. Blackjack is yeah. my game and Roulette. I have the secret to winning at Roulette. Uh, well, I'm Roulette telling, is the loser's game. Uh, I mean, but you know what? There's every, a way, there's every a way to dealer, do it. Cover your bet. Every dealer in Vegas will tell you Roulette is a suckers, uh, suckers game. I always, uh, like, quadruple or triple my money I think, whenever I play I think, Roulette. and I'll quote my writing partner again on this, Frank Hanna, the only way to win money in Vegas is to make a movie about Vegas. Oh, that's excellent. That's cool. cool. I mean, some of the biggest movies, um, Oscar winners, have come from the Institute. A yeah. lot of people don't know that. The fact is that I, I've always said, look, if you want to know about Sundance's relevance or whether it matters or not, and because I ask myself that question all the time, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it did. But ask the filmmakers, they're the best people to ask.